everyone, and welcome to this discussion of the Oregon State Budget, which we've entitled Back to the Future because we are revisiting this subject. We presented last September before the um, vote on Measure 97, which was a vote to increase corporate taxes, which as you know, um, was defeated. Um, and we are now revisiting to see how things look um, after one legislative session in one year. My name is Barbara Dudley. I will be moderating this panel. This program is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Portland. Um, in the League, we work to protect democracy and help preserve and promote our right to participate in government through voting and through understanding and speaking out on issues that affect our communities. This program is being taped by Metro East Community Media for rebroadcast and will be available for online viewing at the League of Women Voters of Portland website soon afterward. The program is supported by a grant from the Multnomah Bar Association, uh, Multnomah Bar Foundation. Our speakers tonight will give us different perspectives on an issue that impacts all of us, which is Oregon's financial status as a state, its challenges and opportunities. Um, Senator Michael Dembro, to my left, represents Oregon, Oregon Senate District 23. He was first elected in 2008 to the State House, House and was appointed to the Senate in November 2013 and re-elected again by voters in 2014 and 2016. Michael currently serves as chair of the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Prior to joining the legislature, he taught writing and film studies at Portland Community College and served as president of the PCC Faculty Union for 16 years. Jeremy Rogers is the vice president of the Oregon Business Council, where he oversees policy analysis on issues related to state finances, including taxes, PERS, employee health care costs, Medicaid, and other issues. In his role at OBC, Jeremy manages the Oregon Business Plan, an effort by business leaders and organizations to work with elected leaders on a shared agenda to grow jobs, to raise incomes, and to reduce poverty in Oregon. Jeremy has a bachelor's degree in politics and government from the University of Puget Sound and a JD from Lewis and Clark Law School. Um, a year ago, this audience heard about Oregon's finances, including the opportunities and the challenges that laid ahead. A year later, we want to know what has changed and what our new challenges might be. Unfortunately, the Department of Administrative Services, DAS, was unable to participate in tonight's program. But they gave us permission to print the executive summary of their latest economic and revenue forecast, which is in your program. You can access the complete report at the website included in the summary. Keep in mind some of the key points from this summary as you listen to tonight's speakers. Remember, and I will summarize them very quickly, this is their view, that is DAS's view, and not necessarily ours or our speakers. First, in their summary, nationally, the economic expansion continues and seems to face no immediate threat, although uncertainty of federal policy could put that outlook at risk. Second, Oregon's economy continues to grow with job gains that keep pace with our growing population. The rate of growth has slowed, which is expected in the later stages of a recovery. Today's job report from the Oregon Employment Department illustrates this. Oregon State Employment Economist said that, quote, August's job losses were an unusually sharp departure from months of very large job gains. But looking past recent gains and losses, Oregon's over the year job growth continues to be very good, unquote. Three, Oregon's general fund revenues have exceeded the forecast by more than 2%, which means the kicker will come into play this year. This means a reduction in general fund tax collections for 2018 as taxpayers deduct their rebate, and, it, and uh, as does a weaker outlook for corporate profits mean a reduction in general fund tax collections. But these reductions appear to be offset by greater lottery revenue and legislative changes made in 2017. Fourth and final, compared to other states, Oregon's revenue growth is healthy even as the expansion slows. However, looking forward over the next 10 years, revenues will face downward pressure as baby boomers work and spend less, lowering state income tax revenue. 
So tonight we hope to hear about ideas that our speakers have for Oregon's future and how we can meet the economic challenges and fiscal challenges that we face. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to explain what they see in Oregon's future. What, uh, when they finish, they will have an opportunity to ask each other questions, and we'll also be collecting your questions from the audience throughout, and I will select questions to ask of our speakers. So now we will begin. Senator Dembro. Okay, thank you, Barbara, and thanks. League for having me again this year. I'm really pleased to be part of this and to really engage in a conversation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions and to Jeremy's uh, comments. Jeremy and I work very closely together, actually, and, and you know, I would say our values are quite closely aligned, although we're coming at this from different perspectives. Um, I think most people would agree that uh, the session that just ended and we finished almost exactly two months ago, uh, was successful in many ways. Uh, we were able to uh, deal with a number of, of tough issues that have been lingering for a number of years, legacy issues like uh, transportation. Uh, and we passed uh, a very large uh, transportation bill, uh, which was very difficult. We were unable to do it uh, two years ago. Uh, or last year, this year finally we were able to do that. Uh, we were able to uh, ban the practice of suction dredge mining uh, in this state. Uh, we were able to uh, make it possible for grand juries uh, to have their testimony recorded. Uh, this too has been something we've been wrestling with session after session. Uh, we were able to pass legislation uh, related to um, gun violence prevention. Uh, and uh, every one of those bills passed with some degree of bipartisanship. And then we had a number of bills that passed very, in a very bipartisan manner. Uh, pay equity, um, making work schedules more predictable, um, <clears throat> mining practices in eastern Oregon, uh, a whole slew of bills related to public safety, and reentry, making it easier for uh, individuals <clears throat> who were formerly incarcerated uh, to come back into society and find a place. Uh, we passed uh, three or four really important bills having to do with reentry, and every one of them was bipartisan. Uh, that, that was uh, a real um, highlight. We passed a number of other progressive policy bills, uh, again, in the um, uh, the public safety arena, sentencing reform, uh, cover all kids, finally uh, giving all children in Oregon access to the Oregon Health Plan, uh, the Reproductive Health Equity Bill, uh, a number of really, um, really important legislation, uh, very progressive legislation for those of you um, who like progressive le legislation, as, as I do. And of course, we balanced our budget. Right, which is which is and was no mean feat. Uh, this session, uh, it involved uh, uh, passing uh, a provider assessment on on uh, healthcare um, providers, hospitals, insurers uh, that allowed us to to balance our budget. We were facing about uh, close to a billion dollar shortfall in our public service in our public um, health. Um, in our health services uh, budgets, and the, that assessment largely uh, covered that and allowed us to keep those programs intact, which was really great. As you know, that's under challenge now. Uh, we're going to be voting on that question in January. We're going to be asked whether or not uh, that, um, that decision should stand. Um, I'm hoping that it will, that, that too passed in a bipartisan manner with broad support from industry, and uh, I'm really hoping that we can stick with that. So a lot of good news this session, uh, but of course there were disappointments, and um, the, probably the biggest one for many of us was uh, our inability yet again uh, to pass tax reform, uh, any significant tax reform in the state. Uh, coming on the heels of Measure 97, um, which um, we were debating, it's hard to believe it was just a year ago, it seems much longer, but um, 
uh, Measure 97, which proposed a commercial activities tax, uh, it, um, it failed, and uh, it failed for a number of reasons. And uh, there were uh, a, number of, a number of reasons that we heard from uh, our business partners uh, as to why uh, they thought people should vote against it. Uh, they felt it was too big. They felt that it was unfair because it only covered certain uh, industries or companies or companies of a certain size. Uh, it was felt that we should not be addressing tax reform through the ballot measure, um, that we, we need to be addressing these things uh, through uh, in, in the legislative arena. And uh, we need to address this in combination with cost containment measures such as PERS reform. Um, well, the legislature tried to do all of that this session. Uh, we, um, we designed a commercial activities tax that would have replaced our corporate income tax, uh, which, as perhaps you know, uh, is a very unstable tax. It's great. It gives us a lot of, a lot of uh, revenue when times are good. Uh, but when we're in the downside of the cycle, uh, then it does not. Uh, and, and also, frankly, the um, corporate income tax has not been uh, delivering the way that it historically has. Uh, 20 years ago, it made up uh, a much higher percentage of our state revenues than it currently does. Uh, because, um, as I understand it, companies have gotten pretty good at finding uh, loopholes, taking advantage of tax credits, and in other ways, keeping their, uh, their bills down. So uh, it made sense to, uh, to replace it with this other, uh, this other bill, or this other form of uh, commercial activities tax. At the end of the day, uh, we were not able to get there. Uh, we, uh, had, we were lacking one or two votes. Uh, to get it over the finish line. Um, and a lot of fingers can be pointed as to why that happened. Um, I'm not going to point fingers tonight unless you ask me uh, in your questions. Uh, but, you know, I'll just say at the end of the day, we couldn't get there. And it remains yet again unfinished business for us. Um, we, you know, as I said, we were able to balance our budget in the end uh, because of uh, not only the provider assessment, uh, but also, as Barbara mentioned in the report from uh, DAS, the economic uh, report, our economy is doing well and our revenues came in higher than expected. Unfortunately, they keep coming in higher, which has caused the kicker to kick, and I'll say more about that. Uh, but. Overall, it allowed us to balance the budget and provide record funding for K-12. But at the same time, even though it's, rec it's record funding, it's still inadequate funding. We know if we are committed, as I think we need to be, to fund K-12 education at the level that our quality education model uh, uh, says we need to. So and we'll come back to that. Uh, looking forward, you know, we have uh, ahead of us uh, in 20, the 2018 session a short session where the, the, uh, the sessions in the odd-numbered years are uh, five months long. In the short session, in the even-numbered years, they're five weeks long. And it's, uh, everything is much more concentrated, much more focused. It's very difficult. To, uh, to pass uh, complex legislation that's very controversial in a short session. It's not to say we won't try, uh, but likely uh, we're not going to get to really comprehensive tax reform in the short session unless um, a lot happens between now and then. Uh, because in a short session, you really need to come in uh, with the bill ready to go, where the agreements have been made, uh, the amendments have been written, uh, the, uh, you know, the difficulties have been worked out. Uh, and if that can happen, that'll be great. 
uh, but I think more likely uh, we'll be looking at making another run at comprehensive tax reform in the 2019 session. What I think we can do in the short session, and uh, I hope we do, I'll certainly be pushing for it, uh, is uh, finally refer the individual kicker uh, to the voters uh, for a vote to repeal the individual kicker. Um, we were, I think many of us were surprised back in 2008 when it kicked, um, and it kicked again, what, in 2013, I think? Uh, and now it's kicked again. Uh, as you may know, uh, the legislature can't solve this problem on its own because the kicker is locked into the Oregon Constitution. And so all we can do is vote to refer the, a constitutional amendment to the voters. We did that once before with the corporate kicker. Uh, and the corporate kicker goes to education. Um, I, I believe that if we do uh, repeal the, the individual kicker, it too is going to need to be uh, tied to education. Uh, I believe that uh, the best way to do it is to put it into education reserves, into what we call the Education Stability Fund. Because the whole notion of a kicker is, you know, you get the kicker when times are good. Uh, but times aren't always going to be good. And you want to have something in the bank for when the downturn comes. And I think that's really the, I think most people, that's how they would like to be running their household, and that's how they'd like us to be running our state household. Uh, the polling has historically not been great on kicker reform, uh, but I think that with a serious campaign, I think we should be able to finally uh, get rid of this crazy, crazy system. Yes, we love to think of Oregon as unique, uh, but the kicker is not a way that we want to be unique among the states. Um, you know, I did say that um, we'll be taking a, another run at comprehensive tax reform in 2019. I wouldn't rule out that there'll be um, measures on the ballot. Uh, there's talk uh, about collecting signatures to put uh, some form of the commercial activities tax on the ballot. Um, I hope that we can address it in the legislature. I just, I think it's a better way to do that because, you know, what we, what we were looking at in the short session, I'm sorry, in the long session, uh, with the commercial activities tax was not only uh, creating that tax, but at the same time, as I mentioned, getting rid of the corporate income tax, and at the same time, looking at uh, some PERS reform uh, that would kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, PERS reform is, is asking a lot of our public employees. Um, I think that uh, many, if not most, public employees will step up if they feel that it's not just on them, that everybody, that uh, corporations are also uh, stepping up to solve our revenue problem. Anyway, you really can't do anything that's covering multiple issues like that through the ballot. It really needs to be addressed in the legislature. And that's why I think, uh, you know, I would like to see something that's comprehensive uh, and uh, that, that makes sense uh, done by the legislature. Um, so, you know, looking forward, um, the you know, the, the, the way to uh, balance our budget going forward uh, depends not only on taxes per se, uh, but also the expenditures that we're making and the needs that we have as a state, right? So um, one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of stresses on our state budget is because of the rising cost of health care. So if we as a state uh, can uh, continue the work that we've been doing in reforming our health care uh, delivery, getting more people, getting access for more people, uh, getting, um, using our CCO model, uh, which is a great way to contain costs while uh, extending quality care, um, making bigger pools 
Uh, and the legislature in the last session uh, uh, committed to uh, bringing together uh, our, our two big state pool, uh, healthcare pools, uh, the, uh, the public employees pool and the teachers pool. Uh, and to look for that kind of, of work to uh, bring down the cost to make uh, healthcare more efficient, where our goal is to be able to uh, have the increase in the cost of the, um, uh, the employees' health plans the same as it's been for the CCOs, which I don't know if you know this, it's the costs have been kept down to 3.5% uh, increases which is pretty remarkable and really very important. Um, you know, the, one of the things that the economic forecast looked at is um, the rising number of seniors, uh, which are going to increase our costs. Uh, the rising number of seniors is, without a doubt, a great thing. Um, we're all happy to see that. But it does bring, uh, yeah, considering the alternatives, it does bring a lot of, um, a lot of, <laughs> costs, uh, and, and we need to plan for those costs. There is actually just uh, something, what am I doing on time? Do I have about, fine. yeah, okay. Um, just, uh, there's going to be a roundtable discussion. Some of you may be interested um, at Portland State on Friday afternoon at 2.30. Uh, the uh, Oregon State and Portland State have just done uh, a study on uh, the state of long-term services and supports in Oregon. Uh, and they're showing that uh, uh, the monthly cost of assisted living is um, uh, $3, more than $3,600 a month, more than $44,000 a year. Memory care communities average uh, five and a half thousand dollars a month. Average nursing facility cost for a bed in a semi-private room is $8,425. Uh, and that Oregon has the highest rate of assisted living in residential care communities that accept Medicaid and, and the highest percentage of Medicaid finance residents in the nation. Um, and so what that means is we're gonna continue to see our uh, Oregon health plan costs going up. And so this is something that we really have to plan for and, and adjust for. Obviously, one thing that we need to do is invest in pro things like project independence that allow people to stay in their homes longer uh, as a way of keeping costs down. Uh, in fact, project independence is a good example of what we have to do more of, and that is sometimes you have to spend more in the short term in order to get savings over the long term. That's certainly true in that area. Uh, it's, it's definitely tr true um, in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, low-income people uh, who, and you know, I mentioned before, individuals who are formerly incarcerated. We need to get them into um, wraparound services, housing, uh, treatment, workforce development programs, uh, get them into the workforce uh, so that they're paying taxes and they're uh, productive members of society in order to avoid future costs. I think in general, uh, we need to be investing. We, we have done some, we're starting to make some good investments uh, among our young people in career technical education. Uh, the more that we can uh, increase the skill levels of our workers, uh, the more they'll be able to adjust to the changing economy, the more they will be part of the solution uh, by, um, uh, having, by drawing less from the state and contributing more to the state. Um, we need to con continue to contain our prison costs um, to stop that that increase that we saw in the 90s, in the 2000s. Um, we need to take full advantage of our uh, neighbors who are immigrants and, and refugees who come to this country with a lot of skills uh, but find themselves driving cabs or stocking shelves. Um, that, that too, will help us uh, down the road. 
we need to invest in our rural economies. One of the things I didn't really have a chance to talk about is uh, our economy is doing quite well, uh, but it's doing much better in other parts, some parts of the state than others. We need to find ways to advance uh, the living standards of people all over the state. Uh, we, uh, we need to invest in um, uh, programs that attack greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, and if I have time, I'll be happy to talk more about that. The way that that can be a way both of dealing, of attacking uh, climate change, but also putting Oregon on the cutting ed edge of investment uh, in as we move towards a cleaner, greener economy. Um, all of this, of course, will require that we address those long-standing, deep-seated um, uh, funding challenges that we have. Uh, but there's not going to be one silver bullet that's going to get us into uh, a healthy, wealthy future. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, come back. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Rogers. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Dembro, and uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, the League of Women Voters is one of the most important institutions in our community, and um, educating Oregonians about the critical issues of the day from a nonpartisan perspective. So I'm very pleased to be here to share some of my thoughts about the state budget. My organization, the Oregon Business Council, uh, shares a lot in common with the League. Uh, among the business organizations in the state, we are sort of the think tank. Um, we pride ourselves on nonpartisan policy research and policy development related to some of the biggest issues facing the state of Oregon. Um, and we work closely with legislators of both parties. Uh, we convene public and private sector leaders through a variety of forums, uh, most prominently our annual leadership summit, which brings about 1,200 people from cross parties and cross sectors together at the Oregon Convention Center. Um, and that brings me to the first point that I'd like to make about solving the state's budget challenge, and that is that the business community is a full partner in this effort. Uh, nothing is more important to the economy of the state of Oregon than the long-term fiscal health of the state. Uh, without a long-term solution to the budget, uh, we'll never be able to achieve our collective goals for education and health in our communities. We recognize that the solution to the problem will involve both spending reforms and tax increases on businesses. And the business community has invested heavily in time and analysis to support legislators' efforts to develop a long-term budget solution. Uh, and we have devoted our forums, including our annual summit, to bring people together around these solutions. Um, many business leaders from prominent Oregon companies have become highly engaged and knowledgeable about the scope of the state's budget challenge and about specific solutions. To summarize, the business community has been engaged, we're going to stay engaged, and we have a lot of ideas and solutions to contribute to the conversation. So uh, I thought that the, that the uh, state was going to be here to do the opening and provide a little bit of, of uh, perspective sort of on what the budget picture looks like moving forward. Since they're not, I'll just offer a few comments on that uh, sort of at a global level before I get into more specifics. This last session, the state faced about a $1.5 billion deficit to fund current services. So that means to, to do exactly what it was doing the biennium before um, and to meet all the obligations that it had that, that we were $1.5 billion short. Um, looking forward, uh, we face a similar deficit, uh, maybe a little bit larger even, um, you know, closer to $2 billion in each of the next couple of biennium moving forward, um, despite the fact that we have had really record-breaking revenue growth um, over the last several biennium and, and um, and currently. So what's, what's driving this? Well, there are a few things um, that are most significant. Uh, the first, as you heard Senator Dembro talk about, is Medicaid. Um, that, in the last biennium, was the largest source of the budget deficit. So of the about $1.5 billion deficit, about $900 million of that was Medicaid. And we expanded Medicaid in Oregon um, under the Affordable Care Act and the innovative CCO model that um, Senator Dembro spoke about and supported, that we supported. 
Um, and that expanded coverage to about 400,000 Oregonians, which was a great thing. Uh, Oregon now has, I think, I think I read today, the third or fourth lowest um, un- uninsured rate in the country. Um, but as part of that, uh, th- that was always part of the Affordable Care Act, the expansion population was initially paid for by the federal government fully. But that as always as part of the law, was gonna ramp down to 90%. That first ramp down happened this past, this legislative session that we're in, where it went down to 95% uh, for the, those 400,000 people, and, and it's gonna go down to 90. We also lost some one-time funds that Governor Kitzhopper had negotiated with the federal government. So that's why it was, this by any in particular, such a large uh, chunk. Now that was, addressed this legislative session primarily by increases in taxes on hospitals and insurance premiums. Um, Now, as the senator mentioned, that's being referred to voters in January, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, But uh, as these taxes, these taxes will expire moving forward, um, and we'll continue to shift towards that 10% uh, state funding responsibility. So we will continue to see Medicaid in the future by AM as being a significant portion of the problem, but not as big as we saw this last session. More around five to six hundred million dollars of biennium moving forward um, for the next couple of biennium. Uh, so moving forward, it's a different issue that is going to become the most menacing problem uh, that faces the budget, and that is the Public Employee Retirement System, PERS. So unlike Medicaid, where we have a history of addressing shortfalls uh, through provider taxes every few years, uh, we don't have any dedicated revenue sources to pay for Oregon's $24.5 billion PERS unfunded liability. We currently pay for that liability through a payroll charge on all public employers. Historically, those public employers, so school districts, state agencies, cities, counties, have paid PERS rates equal to about 12% of their salary costs. So that means on top of whatever they're paying in salary, they pay an additional 12% into the PERS fund to cover the pension costs. Today, those costs exceed 20%, and they are marching quickly to exceed 30%. And that's what we're up against right now. Um, and for anyone here who's ever run a business, just imagine how you would have survived paying uh, 30% or more of your payroll costs for retirement. Um, this, of course, does not include the 6% that our public employers also pay for Social Security, and many public employers pay an additional 6% uh, that they uh, pick up on behalf of the employee. So in real terms, th- here's what these these increases look like. This biennium, public employers across the state are paying $1 billion more than they were last biennium for PERS. Next biennium, and that's gonna continue moving forward, that cost isn't gonna go away. Next biennium, they're gonna pay another billion dollars on top of that. And the next biennium, another billion dollars. And by 2023, 2025, or excuse me, by about 2025, public employers will be paying about $4 billion more for PERS than they did in the 2015-17 biennium, the one we just finished. Um, and the cost will remain that high for several years. They won't start coming down until the 2030s. And this, of course, presumes that the PERS fund hits its investment target. Because if it doesn't hit its investment target, which is about 7.2% annual returns, the difference will be made up by even further increases on our schools and our other public employers. Um, Now, the recent court decision on PERS limited what can be done about the issue as it relates to those who are already retired and to benefits that have already been earned. However, the court was equally clear about what can be done. Benefits yet to be earned can be modified, and employees can be asked to contribute a portion of their salary to share alongside public employers and taxpayers in meeting the challenge of these increasing costs. Um, Actually, would you mind throwing up the slide? So uh, I have a slide up here. This shows the public employee contributions to defined benefit pension plans across the U.S. And uh, what you see in that little red bar there is Oregon. Uh, So we are an outlier in that we do not require contributions from employees to the defined benefit pension plan. The one, that's the the PERS fund that has the deficit. Um, Most states do. Uh, The average, about 28% of the contributions that are made to the system are made 
by employees, the rest by employers. Here, it's all made by employers. Um, and if you look at the next slide, uh, oh, I have the clicker. <laughs> uh, most states, oh, there we go. Most states, uh, as you can see, all the blue states have increased the employee contribution to their pension system since 2009, as other states have also faced increasing cost. Oregon, uh, you can see, is one of the few states that hasn't. Um, and <clears throat> while 70% of the liability for PERS, that's, yeah, thanks, is due to retirees, which can't be reformed, 30% of it is due to current workers. Well, 30% of a $24.5 billion liability is a lot of money. That's $7 billion. Um, and if we were to have employees even contribute a portion of that, we could add weeks to the school calendar and add tens of thousand people and continue to pay for tens of thousand people on the health plan. Um, so even if we're, we subscribe to the principle that current employees should not have to pick up the tab for those already retired, dramatic improvements can be made legally to our fiscal landscape by asking current employees to pick up some portion of the defined benefit pension. Um, now, 40, about 40% 40 of our current workers in Oregon are tier one and two. So those are the employees that have the richer PERS benefits. Um, so uh, we also can tailor solutions to uh, ask more from the tier one and two employees than we do from the tier three or OPSERP employees, those that have been hired more recently and don't have as rich of benefit plans. Now, we offered several versions of uh, employee cost sharing legislation in the last year. Um, uh, none of them asked employees to pay uh, for any liability that wasn't associated with their own benefits. All of them asked tier one and two employees to pay a greater share of the burden than younger, more recently hired employees. None of these proposals asked employees to do more than they would be expected to do in other states. All of them saved schools, cities, counties, and state agencies billions of dollars. And other than some informational hearings in the Senate at the beginning of the session, these proposals never had a public hearing in the House, um, and nothing ever happened to them, and no major discussion ever took place in the legislature about them other than informational sessions at the beginning of the session in the Senate. Now, uh, going forward, employee cost sharing for PERS is going to need to be an important part of this conversation. Now, another issue that doesn't get as much attention but is uh, uh, also a very large uh, impact on the budget is the uh, cost of public employee health care. So Oregon's costs for state employee health plans are about 50% higher than state employees in other states. Um, the average cost to insure a state employee through the Public Employee Benefit Board, PEB, is over $17,000 per year in Oregon, compared to about $13,000 for neighboring states and for large private employers in Oregon. That's a difference of roughly $4,000 per year per employee. $4,000 times 50,000 state employees is $200 million a year or $400 million per biennium. And that's just state employees, not including K-12. $400 million of biennium is a significant uh, contribution towards the deficit that we have. And a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that those dollars could be spent on if we can control the costs of the public employee health care plans. Now, like PERS, we put forward some very thoughtful ideas on how to bring these costs down. These are not draconian measures, but rather best practices used in other states and in maybe many private sector plans that help create incentives for all of the parties involved, insurers, providers, and the consumers to use the appropriate level of care and to keep costs down. For example, right now, one of the reasons why the costs are so high in PEB is that state employees contribute only one to 5% of the premium. That means when the cost of a plan goes up by $100 per month for the employer, for the state or the school district, or this is for the state, but then it only goes up by $5 a month for the employee. So the average plan for state employee costs the state $1,400 a month, but the employees are paying $70 a month. This kind of system creates no incentives to keep costs down. Um, an employee, even a young, healthy employee, will pick a more expensive, more comprehensive plan because it doesn't cost them anything. Um, and that's not the right incentives that you build into a healthcare plan system if you want to try to keep costs down. So there's a lot of things that can be done that don't 
dramatically reduce benefits for everybody, but just improve the way that the plans are offered and that the and, and designed. Um, for example, rather than a percent percentage of the premium, the employer contribution should be a fixed amount, a fixed dollar amount, um, with a range of insurance plans that come in at or below that amount. And then if the employee wants a more generous plan, they can pay out of pocket for it. That's how it works in the federal government, which provides very high quality health care plans at a fraction of the cost of the state of Oregon. It's how it works in many private sector companies, and it's even how it's done for teachers in Oregon but not for state employees. This change alone could save tens of millions of dollars as employees start to choose plans that better meet their needs. This is just one example of where PEB uh, is not following best practices in health insurance design and contribution strategies. There's a little paper in the back that talks more about this along with our ideas on PERS. Again, we put forward proposals, bills, we had amendments, and they did not get heard in the legislature. Um, so now I want to talk about taxes. While taxes need to be a part of the solution, low tax revenue in and of itself is not the cause of the problem. Oregon has one of the strongest runs of revenue growth among any state in the nation. Our general fund is up 40% over the last six years. We haven't had a run like this since the 1990s. We have increased our state investment in K-12 education by $2.5 billion since 2011-13. According to the National Teachers Union, Oregon now spends more on K-12 education than all but 17 other states. We've jumped up dramatically in the last five or six years by making huge investments in each biennium, thanks to the legislature's wise choice of prioritizing education. Um, now, we, we can and should have healthy debates about the appropriate level of business taxation, but the reality is that while Oregon's revenue mix might be different than other states, our overall revenue levers are, levels are not low by any measure. And if we are looking for a reason why our graduation rates are low, our class sizes are high, and while we can't keep up with expenses even in the best of times, the answer is not because we have low revenues. The revenue is coming in at a rapid pace. It just can't keep up, keep up with a storm of growing costs and expenses. And that's why the solution needs to address both revenue and expenses. Finally, I want to talk about reserve funds. Uh, Oregon has two reserve funds, the Rainy Day Fund and the Education Stability Fund. These funds can only be tapped during recessions. To be able to weather a moderate recession, we believe that those funds should be uh, equal to about 10 to 15% of the general fund. Uh, at the end of the, this biennium, 2017-19, they will be at about 7.5% of uh, the general fund. It's good, better than we've had before, but not good enough to, to weather a, a, a moderate to, to large recession. So as Senator Dembro mentioned, we just get, we're going to give out kicker checks. We gave out kicker checks a couple of years ago. Um, and if we had instead put those kicker checks into the reserve funds, we would have an adequately funded reserve right now and we'd be able to weather a recession. So I think it's one thing we completely agree on is let's put the kicker in a reserve fund. Even if you can only get it to pass in a way that does it for wealthier individuals or that everyone gets the first 100 or $200 a kicker back and then the rest goes into the rainy day fund, We've got to figure out how to make that happen so that we can prepare for the, for the bad times. Because these are the good times and we're already struggling. So as we look forward to solutions on taxes, let me just offer a few thoughts. Start by putting the kicker in the reserve fund. Um, second, uh, if, the focus is on make, if the focus is on making changes to the existing tax system, the existing tax code for businesses, um, and it's done alongside reforms to PERS and public employee health insurance, I think that's something that could be done Im immediately. In fact, in the last legislative session, we put forward a proposal of $500 million of increased business taxes, along with $500 in cost reforms to PERS and public employee health care plans. Um, it was not met with much reception because the leadership in the legislature doesn't want to make tweaks to the existing system. They want to create a new tax of, uh, based on gross receipts or gross sales. Now, if we're going to move to a new type of tax, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to get it right. Um, and I won't get into all those complexities, but um, one of the key issues is figuring out how to get it right, both for, uh, for all different types of business entities. So you have your traditional corporation, which is called a C corporation, but you always also have a, a, a large number, in fact, a majority of businesses in the state that are unincorporated uh, business entities like LLCs, partnerships, etc. Well, 
for example, the proposal that was put forward in the legislature would create a gross receipts tax on business and get rid of the corporate income tax. Well, the corporate income tax is only paid by the C corporations. All of those other companies, uh, LLCs, partnerships, S corporations, they pay their business taxes through their personal income taxes. So you had a situation where the largest companies, the C corporations, were going to get a swap. They were going to get rid of the corporate tax, and they were going to uh, get rid of the corporate income tax, but to have this new tax. But these other companies were going to have the new tax, but not get rid of the tax that they were paying and so uh, on their income. And so that's sort of the type of complexity that we have to work through to, to get this right. I think it's it's possible, um, but there's just a lot of different players out there, and it's not the large companies that are the ones that are going to be the, um, uh, most concerned. It's a lot of the smaller companies that uh, don't want to be double taxed both on their sales and on their income. Um, so I know that time's running short. So I think uh, as I'll wrap up, I'll just say uh, finally, w most importantly, I think how we get there matters. The blame game won't work. Blaming businesses and business owners as greedy corporate mongers who don't pay their fair share, it's unproductive and it's untrue. Um, the reality is the Oregon businesses are a critical part of this solution. Same goes for public employees. Blaming them, attacking them is not going to work. Um, second, the place this needs to be solved is the legislature, not the ballot. Uh, like the issue I just talked about, that's something that can only be resolved through the give and take of a legislative process. In a ballot measure, it will be drafted wrong and it'll be bad policy. Third, the spending and revenue must be tackled together. I mean, the same committee, the same process. Because what will happen if you don't do that is you won't have the trust. You won't have the trust of those who are going to have their taxes increased, that the spending reforms will happen, and you won't have the trust of the public employees to engage in the spending reform conversation if they don't think the tax is going to happen. So it has to happen together. Representative Bentz and Boquist have proposed a uh, bipartisan committee to start working now to get ready for 2019 and to tackle both spending and taxes. I think that's a great idea. We'd love to uh, participate in that. Um, and the governor will have to play an important leadership role in convening and making this happen. And if that, if that leadership doesn't happen from the legislature or the governor right away, we're unfortunately likely to face more very expensive and divisive ballot measure wars in 2018, which is not good for anyone. The policy that comes out of it is not going to be good. Huge waste of money that we could have instead spent on working on things we agree on, like the kicker and like coming up with a joint spending and tax plan. So let's do that instead. Thanks. Thank you both. That was very helpful. I think we have two things we just heard agreement on that we don't need to then belabor, but I think we should memorialize that we have agreement on them. One is to get rid of the kicker. Um, and I think I heard you, Jeremy, say that the business community would support that, would support sending it to the voters in a referendum um, to, to undo the constitutional requirement for the kicker. It sounds like the legislature would, too. So am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, and I, can, I can't speak on behalf of the whole business community, but the kicker reform sign the Oregon Business Council has supported. Um, and I think that um, and mo mo many other business organizations also support. And I assume that both of you would agree that that's to go to a rainy day fund as opposed to back into the general fund. Do you think that's a fair summary, I Senator? Do. I think that's the only way really we can do it. Okay. I agree. I didn't hear his answer. Yeah, I said yes. I think that having it go to a rainy day fund and most likely uh, dedicated uh, to an education rainy day fund uh, is really the only way that we could expect the voters to support us. Oh. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. The, the, other, the other agreement that I think I heard was that there needs to be um, an agreement that includes both expenditures and revenue um, reforms, and that it is best to do that through the legislature rather than through ballot initiatives. Um, and so I think what, if, if you two could help each other get to a little more specificity on that, I think, by asking each other questions about your positions. That would be very, very helpful. Um, and Senator Denbro, you, you can start. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm intrigued, Jeremy, by um, the 
Uh, the PERS proposals that, well, first of all, let me back up and say, um, you know, I appreciate your pointing out that uh, the, the big problem here is with our tier one, tier two, uh, people who've retired, people who've already um, uh, or are towards the end of their working lives. Uh, because we made uh, some substantial changes back in uh, the early 2000s. And while, yes, it's true that uh, employees are not um, sending their own contributions into the main, uh, the main PERS pool, that's because of, of reforms that we did back in 2003 that created a separate side account which at the time seemed like a good idea to solve the problem, uh, but in fact, um, um, now there's a desire to change that. So uh, the, question, the question is, um, we're asking a lot of that 30%, you know, the current uh, employees who are going to be asked to, uh, to largely sol solve the PERS problem. Um, and so I'm wondering um, if you could be more specific about how what you are proposing would um, just, you know, affect their uh, benefits as opposed uh, to helping to pay off the liability. Yeah. So um, what we proposed really was built off of what the City Club proposed in 2011. And in fact, if you haven't read that report, it's still the best piece of work that's ever been done on PERS. And it's still quite relevant because nearly all of their top tier recommendations have not been implemented. Um, and so what they recommended was to uh, redirect the side account contribution to the main PERS fund um, uh, with an emphasis on the tier one and tier two employees. And that's what we put forward. So we put forward a proposal that was a employee contribution to the pension fund uh, of 6% of salary for tier one and tier two employees and 4% of salary for tier three or OPSERP employees. And the uh, employees had the option of whether they wanted to pay out of pocket for that contribution or if they wanted to redirect their sort of side account 401k style plan contribution into the PERS fund. Um, so they could make a choice about whether they had an impact on take home pay or if they were having an impact instead on the growth of their um, side account, which is like a 401k style account. Um, and uh, the reason why, one of the reasons why City Club came up with this recommendation is because they used what was called an adequate retirement benchmark um, in their analysis to determine what reforms they thought made sense. And so if you look around at the sort of expert um, analysis on this, the, the adequate retirement benchmark is about what this is what they call it's, it's the replacement ratio. How much money do you need to be earning in retirement as a percentage of your salary? And the experts say it's about um, somewhere between, you know, 80, 85 percent is is the target. So tier one and two employees get 50 percent replacement. Um, of their salary as part of the pension formula. And then they get their side account, right, which has been growing since it was created in 2003. And that replaces another percentage of their salary. I don't have the exact numbers on me. The City Club did do this analysis, though. Um, so say it's, you know, 15 to 20 percent. And then they get Social Security. Um, in fact, in about half the states that have state pension plans, uh, the states don't also participate in Social Security. Um, they do it in lieu of Social Security. So here we they also get Social Security. That replaces another 20. I'm sure it's ha half of this. Yeah, it, it's half. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and you can end up, you can look it up and I'll provide the, I can send the link around to this. It's a lot of states. Um, and the, um, so if you add that up, um, you know, you, you exceed the retirement benchmark. And so there's room to come down. So that, that's sort of the analysis. So what we would like to see is, is an opportunity to go through that kind of analysis and develop the solution that makes sense. But that requires open conversation and willingness to have uh, public hearings and discussions about PERS. And unfortunately, the issue is so sensitive, that's not how it works in Salem. 
even when PERS reform is passed, it's cooked up privately and then rammed through because of the chaos that's created when you have a public process around it. That makes it very difficult to have these conversations. So we'd like to have that conversation. We think that some, um, mo you know, a modified version of what we put forward, which is similar to what Senate Bill uh, 1068 had in it that didn't end up getting heard. Uh, there was a bill that, that didn't get heard that the legislature put forward. So there's room for that discussion, including how it impacts employees. Let, let me um, add a, a, an additional question to Senator Demrose's question, which is I understood that the business community or OBC specifically was also going to, or had also, I thought you just said, put forward a revenue proposal that was joined with its expense proposal, but I never um, heard much about that. So could you elaborate just briefly Yeah, and on there's that? a document back there that has it. And we, so we came forward in June, uh, I think it was May 31, to the revenue committee that was looking at the gross receipts tax. They had yet to have a public hearing. So we asked Senator Haas for the opportunity to have invited testimony. Patrick Kreitzer, the CEO of Tillamook Creamery Association, who's the chair of the Oregon Business Plan, came forward with a $500 million package that was an increase in corporate income tax. So it would increase the corporate income tax rate from a high of 7.6% up to 9.1%. It got rid of the uh, early payment discount that is given to business-related properties for paying your property taxes early, uh, and 40% of that. Uh, even though that's local revenue, 40% of it goes to schools and community colleges, so we, we, it was a benefit to the state. Uh, we proposed, um, what were the other two elements of that? Um, the, uh, uh, there was one or two other elements, it's in that paper back there, I'm okay. sorry. The no, biggest portion of it was the corporate income tax increase, yeah. and, and it was an odd situation. We were, in fact, we were not greeted with re the type of receptivity you would expect with a $500 million offer of tax increase. Um, in fact, there's been you know ballot measure wars. Measure 66 and 67 only together raised about 500 million. That used to be a large amount of money, but I think what happened with Measure 97 sort of reset the conversation. It was so big um, that it seemed what happened was legislators, the legislative leaders were not interested in taxes from business if they weren't um, well north of a billion dollars and that they weren't a structural change that was largely based on gross sales. So, Senator Jim Burke, yeah. yeah. If I could just say something about that. You know, I think that um, it is true. Um, one of the interesting things that happened over the course of the session was um, even though Measure 97 went down and you know, I have to say that uh, there were members of my caucus who didn't support Measure 97. Uh, but as the legislature started working on the commercial activities tax, which was in many ways similar to what was proposed in 97, uh, the more attractive it became uh, for many of us. Uh, so, you know, in, in my caucus in the Senate, uh, by the end of the session, there was um, a real sense that, boy, we have to move beyond that corporate income tax. We have to change models. and um, and. The, the more that uh, we looked at it with advice from our, our legislative revenue office, uh, the more attractive it looked. And so, you know, I wouldn't say that it was really uh, a question of the amount of the, the, the revenue so much as, you know, the structure uh, and that it was something that was going to be much more stable. Uh, much less prone to the vagaries of the economy, and one that would be much more difficult to game, if I could put it that way, you know, to find workarounds uh, so that uh, companies uh, don't have to pay their taxes. So, I, you know, I think that uh, for us to go back to the, you know, to, and, and have the corporate income taxes our starting point, I think that's going to be difficult. Uh, but I, I really uh, agree with Jeremy that those conversations really need to happen now uh, because we're still, you know, I guess pretty far apart. I, I have two questions from that, one from the audience and one just in response to that, which is I'd like to hear uh, your response, Jeremy, to the commercial activities tax idea. Yep. Um, and then um, someone uh, put forward a question about Governor Brown's committee that's looking at ways to deal with PERS um, and wondering whether um, you all have any hope for, for that committee. 
Sure. So, um, you know, on an individual company basis, you know, we actually have some companies and it's mostly the larger, more profitable global <laughs> companies that support uh, moving to a commercial activities tax it, in some way and many for many of them for some of them it's a benefit and for some it's you know the change isn't significant enough to um, where we really see the pushback is with what I mentioned the S corporations uh, partnerships LLC's most of those aren't OBC members my members are mostly the large C corporations um, you know as as an individual organization we'd have a easier time getting to a, 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 a commercial activities tax than, than most of the other businesses in the state. And, and that's the problem is that most businesses are not C corporations. They are these other entities. And the, the problem we have is that they currently pay a 9.9% .9 tax rate on their income because it passes through their owner's income. We ha if we're going to move to a tax based on sales, we have to figure out how to fix for that so that they're not both paying a 9.9% tax on their income and the commercial activity tax. And for some reason, there was such a focus on figuring out how to fix this for the C corporations by getting rid of the corporate income tax, um, which is an important part of it, but not so much on that other part. And so that's where, and, and that, you know, what we wanted to do was come to the legislature with a solution that we knew we could build a coalition of businesses around and, that, and that, that none of them would refer it to the ballot. I think the problem is that building the coalition for the gross receipts tax is much harder because it impacts so many people differently. And some of them might decide to go and refer it to the ballot because for their industry, it's really harmful, even though a lot of other businesses might support it. So that's the challenge is how do you craft it so you actually can get the broad base of businesses, none of which will refer it. And there's a lot of those business businesses and groups out there that have a lot of money that could refer it um, that aren't OBC and, and others. And, and we want to prevent that. So is it possible? I think so. But it's going to require um, work beginning right now and a lot more people than, you know, just me and a handful of business, uh, business groups in the room. It's, it's, it's going to require a lot of business involvement that uh, folks that we don't even interact with uh, regularly. Michael, do you have a, um, any further comment on that? No, just one, you know, one thing I want to add is, uh, you know, with respect to the S corporations, so, um, you know, there's a sense that that also is part of the problem is that, you know, one of the reasons that 20 years ago, um, and I forget the amount, 18% of Oregon revenues came from uh, corporations, and now it's down to six, is that uh, a number of corpora corporations uh, restructured themselves as S corporations in order to uh, pay a lower rate and avoid those corporate taxes. Uh, so, um, and they made legitimate business decisions, right? And so as we uh, try to solve this, yes, you know, certainly there's going to be uh, some concern there. And we need to, you know, we need to come up with something that, you know, certainly doesn't over penalize them. But, you know, to be honest, we also have a situation, and this came up, uh, we had a, a House bill, I think it was 2060, uh, which uh, had to do specifically with S corporations and something that uh, a tax credit uh, that, that they're able to receive for, you know, when they pass through their income into their um, uh, into their personal income taxes. They, they actually, so you'll have um, an individual owner who's actually paying a lower tax rate than uh, people who work for him and or her. And that, that was designed um, as part of uh, the grand bargain of 2013 as we were trying to, uh, we were dealing with PERS back then and we're doing some trying to do some revenue restructuring. Most of the PERS part of it got thrown out, uh, but the tax credit stayed in. And the, um, what it appears is that it's largely being used in ways that weren't intended. Uh, so it's, it's mostly being used not by manufacturers adding jobs, which was really the intent of it, uh, but rather um, uh, legal or medical practices where you know, you'll have the legal partners who are paying 
uh, you know, a much lower rate actually than the legal assistants that work for them. It's kind of a crazy thing. And that too, I believe, needs to be on the table as we're trying to reform this in its entirety. So, so in terms of that reform this in its entirety question, um, to go back to, you mentioned that um, Cliff Benson and Senator Boquist have a proposal, both of them being Republicans, have a proposal for a bipartisan committee to address both the PERS issue and presumably other expense issues as well as revenue. And then Governor Brown has this committee looking at ways to reduce the PERS deficit. I don't know if it's also looking at revenue, but are either of these, are, is there any hope in either of these to get us somewhere so that we actually might avert all the ballot measures we see coming down the pike and get something happening in 20, 19. <laughs> I think there are some common sense PERS reforms that can happen uh, that uh, a lot of people would agree to without, um, you know, they just make a lot of sense, having to do with, re with reserve funds and with um, uh, just that, I don't know, so there, there, there are some, some things that I think a lot of people would, ag would agree on, uh, even to the point of perhaps uh, trying to figure out how many years you base the uh, liability on. Is it over 20 years? Is it over 30 years, et cetera? Uh, and I think that uh, the, uh, the group that the governor has convened, uh, I'm optimistic that they can uh, capture some of the low-hanging fruit. Uh, but I think for the tough issues, uh, you know, I think as Jeremy says, it's going to take uh, people sitting together and looking both at the expenses and at the and at the the tax reform uh, part of it together, uh, because really uh, there has to be um, sorry there has to be a lot of uh, of trust built and and credibility that this is being addressed so that one group is not uh, carrying all the the weight but rather. Um, you know, we all have a commitment, we all have a responsibility uh, to invest in Oregon's future. Uh, and nowhere is that more true than when we think about K-12 education. Um, but we all have to see ourselves as being in this together. Uh, that, I think, is the really critical uh, uh, prerequisite for us getting, to get, getting anything done. Senator, actually, this is one of the questions I had from you. Um, you know, it, it, will the legislature form a bipartisan committee? Is there anything you can do to help promote that? Um, I saw that op-ed from Senator Boquist and Representative Bentz about three weeks ago, I think, that ran on the Oregonian uh, suggesting that. I haven't heard anything since, but I think that would be a great idea, so I'd love your take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're actually um, all coming together next week for our quarterly uh, committee meetings. And I expect that we're going to be talking about that. It's, um, it's really better, I think, when we have those conversations uh, there at the Capitol as opposed to through op-eds and press releases and Twitters and Facebooks, which unfortunately that, that tends to happen. Uh, that tends to be the summer entertainment. Uh, but then we come together and try to get some work done. I have another question um, from the audience that I think um, gets it bigger problems for you to solve in the next 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that, and, and I think, um, Senator Embro, you were the one actually who outlined a lot of this, but there are a lot of very serious expenses coming up for this state and that already exist for this state that are not just PERS and they're not just Medicaid. Um, they are, you know, your aging infrastructure, your aging population. Um, a lot of, we have, you know, yes, the economy is growing, but it's certainly growing in a very unequal way, and we have enormous housing um, crises in many p parts of the state. So there, there are going to be a lot of things that will cost us a lot of money. Um, and I, I don't see a lot of hope in the near term, anyhow, from the federal um, uh, government. So um, how do you address that? It doesn't, it's not just solving the PERS problem. It's, it's getting more significant revenue for long-term needs. So I guess that goes to you first, Senator Dembro, since it's on your shoulders, and then we'll let Jeremy <laughs> weigh in. Yeah. Um, 
you know, as I mentioned, and as Jeremy mentioned, uh, we have um, we have been putting more and more money into K twelve education, um, but a lot of it has been at the expense of other parts of state government. Nowhere more so than our natural resource budgets and our uh, environmental protection budgets, where um, we, you know, those budgets get cut. Uh, in order for us to shift bu uh, funds over to education. Um, another example of that is higher education, where uh, our higher ed budgets have been slashed uh, because we can always substitute fees, tuition, in the same way that with our natural resource budgets, we can institute fees of various sorts. So. As a state, this is what we've come down to. Because we haven't solved this comprehensive uh, budget uh, revenue problem, we're kind of nickel and diming uh, our, our um, citizens by these fees uh, and making it really hard for, you know, certainly for students uh, to go to college and university and uh, for us to really be doing the investments in our, uh, you know, industrial oversight that we need to be doing. So it's, um, these things are all of a piece. And, uh, you know, we, we need, I believe that we need more revenues into our general fund in order to cover uh, all of these things. You know, I, I didn't mention, um, you know, I mentioned seniors, but, you know, we also have uh, people with disabilities uh, that we want to be full participating members of, of uh, our communities. And that requires us to, you know, invest in them and to make sure they get the supports that they need uh, and that they're not uh, just depending on the wherewithal of their friends and family. So th those are just some examples. Yep. Um, no, I agree that the needs are significant. I think one, probably the, the starting point is, um, and we can help with this because we've done it outside of state government because it's not being done inside of state government, but the tools are there to, to create a 10-year budget and let's build this revenue and spending plan to fund that, not just the next two-year budget. Um, I mean, one of the major downfalls of, of state government budgeting is it's all about balancing the current budget so you don't see these things. Well, we built it, we created a model of the state budget, looks out over a decade, incorporates all these demographic drivers, the aging population, the increase in cost of long-term care, all that kind of stuff. So we can kind of see what those costs are. Um, we've shared that with the with the state, and we've shared it with legislators, but if we could have the, the conversation we're talking about, about coming up with a plan that deals with both revenue and expenditures around that, then I think we can develop a plan, we can agree upon the size. I, I don't think it's particularly helpful when we just list a bunch of needs and say, well, of course we need as much money from you as we can get business because look at all these needs. Well, the way a business person's gonna come at it, it and, and you know, trying to support something is say, okay, what are the needs? What, let's talk about it in a more detailed way so we know what we're investing in. And I think that if that's the way we have the conversation, we'll, we'll get to a better place. I also think that, you know, even if we aren't able to solve it all right away, we'll create a culture of being able to work together and solve it. I think that the local government um, tax and spending issues need to be part of this too. I mean, the property tax system in the state is broken. And so we have to figure out how to deal with that, whether it's part of this as one conversation or it's the next conversation, we've got to figure that out. Um, and, um, and at some point, I think, you know, the, the conversation will have to shift away from just taxing businesses. I mean, I think right now the conversation is about taxing business because it's politically you know, doable and, and other people don't want to pay more taxes. But if, if the reality was that we need $5 billion a biennium more to pay for all these things, I don't think that's what we need. But what, that's not something you're going to do just by taxing business. Everybody would have to be accepting higher taxes. So if we have to be honest about that, if we really think that that's the level of need that there is out there. And I think that gets us to maybe the last question before closing comments. But um, there is a question here about isn't the commercial activity tax just another form of sales tax as 97, Measure 97 was accused of? And I think the bigger question is, will we ever 
be able to enact a sales tax, or will we ever be able to increase property taxes and sort of undo some of the, the damage to school budgets that was done by those measures? Um, so I, I think to me that's a, that's a critical question. Are we only looking at income tax here? Um, whether it's corporate or personal, or are there other, is there any hope for other forms of taxation? <laughs> it's great, it's great question. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a great uh, question. And, you know, it's funny, um, people are always saying, well, um, we have so many new Oregonians uh, here, people who come from states where they had sales taxes, and they're comfortable with sales taxes. So just put it on the ballot, and it should pass. Uh, but, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, you know, people come to Oregon, they fall in love with Oregon. And unfortunately, it seems that they also fall in love with our not having a sales tax. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, you know, the, and, uh, you know, I think that there are a number of advantages to a sales tax, but it, it's just really hard for me to see us getting there, uh, to be honest. Um, I do believe that you know the notion that a uh, um, commercial activities tax is a hidden sales tax is is kind of a specious argument. I mean, you could say that about any tax, right? I mean, you know, if a company is paying corporate taxes, uh, presumably they have to adjust their prices in order to be able to afford those those income taxes. Um, so why is that not a sales tax? I mean, you, you could say that. Uh, answer that if you would like. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. No. I'd, 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 no, I'd love to hear that. But um, you know, I think that uh, it, it is a fair question. I think we we need to. Peop, people just want to feel that they're paying their fair share and they're not taken advantage of. And um, you know, I think looking at. Uh, the way that the share that um, uh, business taxes, corporate taxes, have come down over the years, uh, that creates uh, a sense of distrust among people. So I, I do believe that this is something we need to address. Do you want to respond to? Oh, well, I, don't, I mean, I, yeah. I don't need to on that. I mean, the, 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 the main point is that a gross receipts tax is tapping, it's taxing the top line, so it's before they have earned any profit. And so you essentially you have to build that into the price of your product because it's, you know, if, if something costs you 99 cents to make and you're getting taxed and you sell it for a dollar and you get taxed two cents on it, well, that doesn't really work. A profits tax, the corporate income tax, you've already earned your profit. So it's, it doesn't do that to low profit margin companies. You've already earned your profit and you pay a portion of that. So it doesn't disproportionately hurt companies that have a lower profit margin and therefore they don't have to pass as much of the cost on. Um, but the, um, I had a point that I was gonna make that was totally unrelated to that. And, oh, I, I do think that as we move forward and Senator Dembro pointed it out, the main reason why um, corporate the amount that's that's contributing to the budget from corporate income taxes has gone down is because most companies have shifted from being a C corporation to an S corp or an LLC. In 1960, every company was a C corporation. Did you know that LLC wasn't invented until the 1990s, and now it's like the most common form of business entity. All of those companies are also paying taxes at at an, in fact at a higher rate at 9.9 percent, but they're not being captured in the corporate income tax statistics. So I do think one thing that would help moving forward and the state can do this is when they present the information about what corporations are paying to actually show what all types of corporations are paying and, and, and see how much of the budget that is versus what it was in 1970. And I'm not trying to, you know, tip for tatter and, you know, knickknack around this. We think that business taxes should be part of the solution. I'm just, I think that's an important point though. Um, one of you, and I think actually both of you said, I, you just phrased it this way, Michael, people just want to feel they're paying their fair share. I think people also want to feel that they know where those taxes are going and that they believe that that's a reasonable expenditure. I think both of those things are true. Um, and um, if, if there were more of that possibility, in the way people pay taxes, that they actually knew what they were for, whether they're you know corporate or personal income taxes, I think that might help. 
Um, it is time to wrap up. Either of you has a closing comment or two of something you didn't get to say or something you want to reiterate. This is your chance. You have a couple of minutes each. Yeah, sure. So um, I will just summarize what I said, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, to just to reiterate, the business community is a, is a full partner in this effort. Um, we think that there are several factors driving this, um, including PERS, including Medicaid, including public employee health care. There are other things as well, as we talked about, that will be coming um, in the future. Um, and there are other issues like you know corrections and other things that, that can be improved upon um, and that, that we can deal with but aren't as big of a part of the budget as some of these other things that we've talked about, uh, but we still should improve upon those areas. Um, we ha there are ideas out there that are legal to make changes to these areas of the budget that need reform, and we are ready and willing and have ideas. Some are on the back table there um, of how to deal with these, and we're ready to work with other stakeholders on that. We do believe that taxes should be part of the solution, but it is important to remember that low tax revenue is not Oregon's primary problem right now. Compared to other states, we are generating a tremendous amount of tax revenue. Um, and uh, we are investing much more of it in education and other priorities, but costs are growing too quickly, and it will require both spending and taxes to deal with that. And how we deal with this is probably the most important thing. Um, do it with revenue and expenses together. Do it in the legislature, not in the ballot. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get a bipartisan committee started now so that we're ready um, for anything that uh, opportunity that exists in 2018 or um, in 2019 and that we uh, don't allow ourselves to fall into the trap of allowing for you know divisive ballot measures or going into legislative sessions unprepared and thank you so much for the opportunity it's really been wonderful to be here i'm so happy that i was asked to share my thoughts and um, i appreciate uh, senator Dembro all of your uh, thoughtful remarks as well thank you thank you uh, thanks for saying that jeremy i feel the same uh, thank you all um, thank you all for coming and hearing a conversation that in a lot of ways is not a new one is it um, I feel like a lot of the things that we're talking about, we have been talking about for many, many years. Um, the um, boy serving in the legislature today, I wish that people 20 years ago, 30 years ago, had been able to fix these problems. Um, we've been working on them for that long. It certainly would make my job a whole lot easier and make it better for, you know, much easier for us to, to give Oregonians uh, the level of service that they, they need and deserve. But, you know, for that reason, it's incumbent on us all to work really hard right now because if we can get this, uh, this thorny problem addressed over the next year or two, uh, then that means people 20 years from now, 30 years from now, are going to look back on us. Okay, let's be honest. They're going to wish we had done more, you know, that we'd done this or done that. Uh, but they're going to be um, they're, they're going to be grateful that we stepped up and really gave this issue the serious attention that it deserves. And and I do believe there's there's not going to be one silver bullet here uh, to solve these budget problems. It's all of it's all of these things that we've mentioned, um, but the um, you know it's the uh, commitment to coming together and getting it done, and not allow this just to become a political football uh, that's going to make the difference. I'm committed to that. Um, you know, I'm sure Jeremy's organization is, uh, and I suspect that just about everybody in this room is, because that's why you're here. So thanks again for coming. Barbara, as always, thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you, one and all. This concludes the discussion for tonight, and I really do want to thank both Michael and Jeremy for very, very thoughtful presentations. I think. If nothing else, we're clearer about what the problems are, even if we may not have solved anything except the kicker. I believe we solved that. Um, so um, you can look on the website of the League of Women Voters of Portland to find the Metro East community media schedule for rebroadcast um, and the Metro East YouTube recording of this program, which you can view online. 
And again, thank you to our donors, the Multnomah Bar uh, Foundation and the Ethel no Noble Memorial Bequest, as well as Metro East Community Media for their support of this program. And thank you to all of you for being here and for caring about this issue enough to really wrap your heads around it. Thank you, and thank you to our panel. <laughs>